Now this uh, next few sessions is about uh, the art and the science of writing, medical writing. And I know for one that when you start on your academic career and you have to write your first paper, how difficult it is. Those of you who have written many papers, this would be largely repetitive. But for those who are in the beginning stages, in the formative stages, taking your first few steps, I hope that what we do will be useful. I know for a fact because I did my MS at the All India Institute and you know there writing is a religion. Whether it's worth writing or not, you have to write. And uh, I was pushed into writing while still a student. And I didn't know what to do. Those days there were no cut and paste. So you have to re retype everything. But then when we started it, I know how difficult it is. Because thesis sky is the limit. Pages don't count. The fatter it is, the better it is. Like uh, world history in uh, your school days or college days, you know. If you write 100 pages, you will get 60 marks. If you write 50 pages, you will get 35 marks. Nobody reads what you write. But uh, paper is very difficult. So I still remember BMJ had an editor called Dr. Stephen Locke. He and his uh, team came to India and conducted lots of workshops on medical writing. And uh, I was a participant in one of those about 25 years ago. And then I found that everything I was doing was totally wrong. I didn't have the vaguest idea how to go about it. And uh, I think therefore, there is always, even if you have written some papers, there is a time to reflect and see whether we have been doing it properly in a friendly atmosphere so that you don't struggle so much. Ultimately, you may produce a paper by struggle, by sweat and toil, but you can also do it and uh, make it a pleasurable exercise. And uh, that is the feeling that uh, we want to leave with you when we finish this uh, workshop. This is the first uh, of those sessions on medical writing. And uh, I will be touching, just touching on many issues. They will be developed in much greater detail in the hands-on exercises that you will have and the various other sessions that uh, my colleagues will conduct later on. So, If you want to stop me at any time, you are welcome to stop me. If you want to make sour comments, you are equally welcome. If you want to write, you are even more welcome so long as you don't show me what you have written. Right? This is what I found. And it is true of many of us. You have an idea and you wish that it could transform itself into paper without the struggle of organizing it. When I was preparing for this, came across this quotation. It says, very famous man, Jean Fowler, he says, it's very easy, all you do is stare at a blank sheet of paper until drops of blood form on your forehead and drip on your paper. But still you find there are no text there, there are only drops of blood. Then what you do next is, this is what <laughs> happens. I am sure you have come across, this is what happens all the time. When you come across people who have written 1000 papers in a career of 30 years, you wonder how you can do that 30 papers a year, every year throughout your career and you know how long these things take. So one way of doing it is have the blood on your forehead and the other way of doing is that you find a willing writer. Have you come across these people? Yes. Huh? Yes, plenty. Huh? Motivation is very important. You know, you can't write if somebody has to force you to write. It has to come from within. And you must feel some force inside you which propels you to put pen on paper. And therefore, you should look at these reasons and see why am I writing this? Do I have something new to say which has not been said before? That type of papers are not very common because then everybody will have a Nobel Prize. That's not. 
but still it may be a small step what others have not said you may like to say you have done something and you have found an interesting observation and you want to share it it may not be all that new it's a little different and you want to share it with others sometimes you don't know whether what you have found is correct or not if you are a senior man and you ask your junior colleagues they will only say one word excellent and if you are a junior person and you ask a senior colleague also you will have one word rubbish right so it's better to give it to peers to see whether what you have written is getting a good feedback you feel that what you say will contribute to the advancement of science these are all good motivating factors but if the last two are your motivating factors then the you may write you may achieve a lot in numbers but you will not achieve much in terms of quality after all it's not enough if you say you got got 1000 papers you must say that at least 10 of them have made a difference to the practice of medicine then only it makes it significant so don't write because you want to see your name in print if you want to see your name in print become a politician you will see it every day three times along with photographs and don't write because you want your cv to become thick then you will never produce good papers before you set pen on paper you must be aware where your product will fit in therefore you must be aware what are the types of articles which are published in scientific journals therefore you can match if you don't do this you may have something excellent to say but if you send it to the wrong person or the wrong type of journal it'll never get published and two or three times you get a feedback some of them are very polite they say excellent article thank you for submitting but constraints of space don't permit us to think i am sure you can publish it elsewhere others are little more rude so that type of rude comments like uh, what you said it inhibits therefore be aware that what are the types of articles and then match your product with that you can have research papers which are based on clinical studies you can have research work based on laboratory or animal experiments you can have new investigations to report for diagnosing disease you have new methods of treatment drug treatment or non drug treatment 10 years later those operative procedures may be useless but at least for those 10 years you have the world net at your feet you may like to publish a clinical series to show some changes in epidemiology from what was thought before you have review articles and you have meta analysis what's the difference between a review article and a meta analysis a review article no longer published that commonly a review article is merely repeating like you write review of literature in your dissertation or thesis so and so said this so and so said this they had so many males so many females like that you go on filling pages however we found these people found this others did not find those are review articles but when you pool the information in several articles and combine it into one whole and then do an analysis that adds the weight of numbers individually they might have published 20 or 30 and you will find that the statistics are borderline but when you combine eight similar articles then it becomes significant that is a meta analysis then you have a whole lot of other things you have what's called a short communication sometimes all journals are under pressure of space if you can write something that you want to say in one or two pages you are much more likely to get it published than if you write 10 or 12 pages and sometimes your observations are important you want to get it into print so that you are the first to say that and you want others to see and respond it is better to send it as a short communication and then later on follow it up with a full report don't spend your whole time 6 months writing a full lengthy article and thereby two other people have already reported that and then you lose the credit for being the first so don't let us look down on short communication short communications have a lot of role then of course some uh, art uh, journals have 
what are called rapid communications. If the editor feels that it needs to be propagated, it will enter a fast channel and then it will appear quickly in print. Letters to the editor. In many journals you will find, many people think that letters to the editor is a poor way of saying things. They have a feeling that these are not indexed, nobody will read, nobody can access. Not true. Many journals, the letters to the editor are indexed. But the only problem is, the full text is not available to the people who are looking at the web. They have to go to the article, uh, go to the journal and then take the letter and read. So, letters to the editor is also an appropriate way of stating your thoughts. Provided it is brief, it is pointed, sharp and it has the advantage that it does not go through the peer review process and therefore, the chance of rejection is less. Then you have historical articles, you have editorials, if you are big enough then others will ask you to write editorials. I put that case reports in yellow because if you take the whole spectrum of what is published, nearly two thirds are case reports. I happen to be the editor of a journal, index journal called Tropical Gastroenterology and 90 percent of the material I receive are case reports. And sometimes the case reports are manufactured. Patients with jaundice of three days duration with an ingrowing tronial. So, you put everything together, the first case reported in the world of jaundice of three days and ingoing toenail. So, but case reports have their place because everybody, some cases are uncommon. To collect sufficient number of patients to write a series will take a whole lifetime. So, you want others also to see and see whether in their own material the same thing is happening. So, you publish. But do not write case reports just for putting it in record. The 300th case of so and so or uh, 240th time this has happened. It may get published nowadays, there are so many journals. Anything you write, you do not have to throw it into the dustbin. There will always be a place where you can publish. But is it worth spending so much time in writing that and putting it in a journal which no one reads? If you have a case report where you have made a very important observation, put it in record, yes. But do not write a case report merely for adding to the numbers. Then response, you know, others write articles, you respond to that, you raise questions about that. That is also a very good thing to do because it starts a discussion. And then reviews. So now the next step is you decide in your mind, I want to write. These are the various things that I can fit into. What is the length of the work that I am writing? Does it fit into a brief communication? Is it an original work? Is it a meta-analysis? Is it a case report? Is it a new investigation? And then choose the journal which publishes those things. Then it is much more likely to be accepted. Having seen that, let us also be now aware what are the different types of journals. So the first message is match your output with the type of article. The second lesson is match your output with the journal where that is most likely to be published. You start with one which has the highest impact factor and then you go down the list and finally you end up with anybody who will accept it. That is the sequence in which authors should work. Right. You have journals where which are targeted across the profession. They are not aimed at any one discipline. They will publish across the discipline if they find that some observation is important to the whole set of readers. National Medical Journal, British Medical Journal, Lancet, JAMA and so on, there you have many more. For instance, if you look back in 1983, two gentlemen in Perth called Marshall and Warren found a new organism in the stomach of people with gastritis. One was a gastroenterologist and the other was a pathologist. Robin Warren was a pathologist and Barry Marshall was a gastroenterologist. They did not put it into a gastroenterology journal or a pathology journal. They sent it 
as letters to the editor to launch it. 25 years later in 2005, both of them got Nobel Prize. Why I am recounting that is, letters to the editor is not a poor way of publishing. It is not a stepchild. You should not look down on letters to the editor. And sending to a general journal is always good because more people will read. Then you have subject based. You know everybody knows in their own subject any number of discipline based Indian Journal of Pharmacology, Indian Journal of Surgery, American Journal of Surgery and so on and so forth caters to one particular field. Then you have subspeciality journals. Urology is one and then subspeciality is there is a journal called Andrology. Now, if you have done outstanding work in andrology and you find that only those who are in that field will read, you put it in andrology. But if you feel that all the urologists are likely to be interested there, you put it in a journal of urology. Then you have disease based journals, you have got so many now, you have got cancer, you have got diabetology, so many diseases have their own journals. Then you have system based journals. Then you have organ based journals like disease of esophagus, hepatology and all. Now you have even an organism based journal. There is a journal for the last five years called Helicobacter. Can you guess how many articles have been published on this viral organism since 1982? Any guess come, let us see. It's called, it's been called the bug of the century, is it not? Huh? It has bugged a lot of people when it is called that, but still called the bug of the century. Just guess. H. pylori. H. pylori. Because so, 20, huh? 25,000 articles have been published since 1982, which are in PubMed. There may be many others which are not in PubMed, but in PubMed, 25,000 articles are listed from 1983 when it appeared in Lancet till now. Every year, nearly 2,000 articles are published on one organism. There is an interesting story about this I like to tell because I admire these two gentlemen a lot. You know, these people were working in Perth in Australia and they did biopsies of stomachs of patients with gastritis many times. Marshall used to do, Marshall was a resident in gastroenterology, he used to do the biopsy, send it across to pathology. Warren used to examine and put up a culture and then 35 times nothing grew because after 48 hours they used to throw away the plates. On the 36th occasion, Easter holidays came in between. So they could not see the cultures after two days. You know Australians are fond of a good life, they are long holiday, they will be on the beach not looking at culture plates. So, they had to see it after six days and there was this organism growing. If the 36th time also there was no Easter, no Nobel Prize in 2005. That is what is called serendipity, accident. You know for everybody, you look for a needle in a haystack and you find the farmer's daughter instead, then you become a Nobel laureate. Otherwise, you get a prick in your finger. All the rest of us fall into that category. Why I am saying this is, as you go down from the top to the bottom, the readership is less. And it is a very, very focused readership. And therefore, the chance of acceptance on those journals is less. Unless it is of great interest to them, they will not publish it. And then you have reviews, clinics and all these things dealing with clinical practice. So after you decide what you want to do with your paper, what is the type of paper, you look at these journals and see where you want to put it and have the best chance of getting it accepted. Now we come to the standard format of medical articles. Fortunately for us, there is only one standard format. It is called the IMRAD format. The A is the A of AND. That is why it is called IMRAD. And it is very simple. 
I stands for introduction, M for methods, R for results and D for discussion. Your article falls into these four headings. There are very few things in your article which are outside this. 99 percent of your article falls within this four headings. What falls outside? The title, the keywords, the abstract, the references, acknowledgements, etc. So, some people now put the title also there and call it Timrad or they put the abstract there and call it Aimrad or they put the summary there and call it, but you let us be respect the memory of the man who described it. He described it as Imrad and I refuse to call it by any other name except Imrad. This was the man who described Sir Austin Bradford Hill, very, very famous statistician. You might have come across a book called Textbook of Medical Statistics written by Bradford Hill, very nice book. He was statistician to the British Medical Research Council and he said and in fact he has been described as the greatest medical statistician of the 20th century. Sir Hill is no longer with us. He looked at articles and said essentially there are only four questions that you have to answer. And what are these questions? They are called the Bradford Hill questions. The first question he said is answer the question why did you do it? If you can answer that question, that section is called introduction. Why did I do this? So, what to look at it in a broader perspective, what do you write in introduction? What is the lacunae in current literature about that particular aspect which you want to solve by doing this? So, introduction consists of a brief statement of current lacunae followed by aims of your study. You answer the question, why did I do this? The next Bradford Hill question is, what did I do? That is simple, you know, that is your methodology. The third question is, what did I find? If you answer that question, you have results written. But that is not enough. You may find so many things. But does it make sense? How does it compare with what others found? That is the answer to the question, what does it mean? Your finding in terms of already published data, what does it mean? That is discussion. Only four questions. Is it not easy to answer? Huh? Today you can all go and write a paper? Yes or no? Right. You may ask why this Simrad format? It gives uniformity to the medical literature. It makes it easy because when a reader knows, if he wants to look for the answer to what did they do, he will look at methods. If he wants the answer, what did they find, he will look at the results. He does not have to search through the whole text. And if you answer these questions only and nothing but the questions, your article will likely to be brief. It is only when you wander away from these questions, you have a lot of world history in your hands and you avoid confusion. It is very, very important for potential authors to know others, how do they approach a journal? Because you have to make your product attractive. Therefore, you should know X, Y, Z or somebody who comes across how do they read the article? Do they start with the title and then go on till the end of references? You have all read articles. Do you read that? What is the first thing that you look at in an article? You look at the title. If the title itself puts you off, if the title is four lines with a lot of hyphens and quotes and all that, you do not feel like following it up, is it not? The title should attract you. If a title says the 54,000th case of so and so, will you read that article? You will not read. You look at abstract should be brief. Many journals have words. You cannot write an abstract of three pages. 
then you cross that hurdle, then you look at the tables. You, know, you don't read text till now. You looked at the title, you looked at where the fellow comes from, you looked at the abstract, you looked at the tables and figures, and then you see, okay, I may proceed. And then you read the rest of the article. At this point, many of us will stop unless you are deep into that subject. Why I am showing this is very, very necessary to have a good title and a proper abstract. Affiliation you cannot help. You are not working in St. John's, you are not working in St. John's. But the title you can choose correctly and clearly and abstract you can write properly. That is the order in which people read. What is the order in which you should start writing? If you start answering the Bradford Hedl questions in that order, you will never cross the introduction. What is, you must write the simplest thing first and then go to more and more complex. What is the simplest thing that you can write in an article? Methods. Is it not what I have done? That, no dispute. You can sit down and in half an hour you can finish that. Is it not? Then after that what you do? You have data. You put it into tables and figures. And after you have the tables and figures, you write two or three lines about each table. That is the results. So already before you can wink, you have crossed three hurdles. Then you do the discussion because you have collected literature before starting to find out the lacuna. So you see what others say and what you have said. Compare and contrast, that is discussion. You know the limitations. Never be afraid to admit your limitations. It is better that you write it down in your discussion than wait for the editor to or a reviewer to point it out. Write your conclusions. When you have done these things, then you can organize your references. Then spend a lot of time on title. Make it catchy. See, movie titles count a lot, is it not? If you have a lousy movie title, nobody will see the movie even if Rajinikant is there. So they may see, but they will probably not see that uh, overtly. But title is very important. Spend some time. And authorship. Authorship, sometimes you have control, sometimes you have no control. If you have control, then you exercise control. If you have no control, you surrender. Because <laughs> in our country, there is nothing like intellectual honesty. Right. Acknowledgements, those who are not important enough to figure as authors, put them down in acknowledgements. Lastly, you see, Bradford Hill's first question right last because that is the part which is most difficult. Why did you do? You will have an idea only after you have finished everything. And then write the abstract. If you do it in this order, you will find that the flow is little better. If you start in the Emirate format, it is much more difficult. There is a session on this, so I will not go into great detail. If you want to know what is an author, who is an author, there are enough material. Because now at the end of the article, you have to tell how are you responsible for that particular publication. Because you are writing papers, you should know who is an author. An author is one who has contributed significantly to one or more of the following. Either he has got the idea, didn't do anything after that, but he has got the idea and he told somebody, look, why don't you try this? But that is the seed from which the paper has grown. One who has planned and designed, one who has done the actual bull's work, the lab work or the animal work or collection of data, analysis, statistical expertise, the person who has actually written. Yes, please. Collection of data, that is original uh, for the authorship. I am not going to go into great detail on this. As I told you, there is a session on authorship. Yeah. But by and large, supposing you engage a paraclinical worker or a social worker to go to the village and collect information based on a questionnaire that you have done, 
and analyze the questionnaire, naturally that social worker is not going to figure as an author. Right. But if it is part of your team, if it's your postgraduate, you're given the idea he is the person who has collected the information, certainly he deserves to be an author. When I say collect, you must look at it in the context. Just mere collection, you know, handing over a questionnaire to 100 households and getting the reply next week and giving it to you, that is not collection of data. So there might be some intellectual uh, contribution. Yes. In Thank you. Anybody who has, that's why I put this word. Going to the household and collecting that is not significant contribution. Legwork, yes, but not intellectual. One who revises or but you know, journals write this and I don't understand. This is how people get into authorship. Because they say somebody who supervises can be called an author. Now, those who don't deserve, who have not contributed, can claim to be supervisors. And then they become authors. But we have to accept as things stand. Today in India, there is very little that you can do about this as long as hierarchy counts. I will ask you a question. You are doing a study on some patients, but you are sending samples to the immunology lab. There is a technician there who is doing the analysis and you are getting the values back. Should the head of immunology be an author? No. But, 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 yes, but, but. I am not going to say anything after the but, okay? But with lots of dots. But it is wrong, you know. It, 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 it is an, he has provided the equipment, he has provided the time, he has provided, uh, uh, permitted his technician to do it, but he has not contributed intellectually to the paper. So, strictly speaking, he is not an author. Just the last slide. These are the steps. Is it worth writing? Decide that first. Discuss with your colleagues and get a feedback before you put pen on paper. Choose the type. I already told you this. Choose the journal. Write the first draft. Show it to somebody. Redraft. Don't become possessive that you have written that and after that you will never change. Change it if people say it doesn't make sense. Finalize it. And then remember the rules of good writing. I am not going to go into great details, tense should be consistent and better to write in active voice. Nowadays everybody will tell you, it is simpler, easier to comprehend and short. Simple words prefer to complex, simple sentences to complex, double negatives, you know, it, it, human minds cannot understand double negatives, but there will be many articles where the sentences where you have to read four times to understand what it actually means. Make sure that you write for a specific audience. Remove redundancy. This is how you will reduce the paper. No editor will accept a paper if it is too long. Avoid digression. Don't go on explaining unnecessary qualifiers, repetition. And pompous language is meant for literature, it is not meant for scientific. This is my last slide and this gives the message. To get your paper published, not only must you have something to say, but you must also know how to say it. And it certainly helps <laughs> if you have a friend who is running a journal. Because you find, read some journals and you wonder how some articles get into it, you know. There are linkages that we do not know about, but it certainly helps. Thank you all very much. I think I have one or two minutes to answer some questions, if you have. And uh, if you don't want to answer questions, then you put down your sour comments and give it to me in writing. <laughs> okay? Right. I just wanted to know about uh, the persons who are involved in authorship. What about the role of the statistician? I showed there, no? There. I showed. No, but uh, to what no, extent can you has, give the… The work is mainly statistical. Hmm. An epidemiological study where the bulk of the work is statistical analysis certainly is, he should be there. But if you collected information, analyze, he has collected uh, calculated one p value, then it is better to acknowledge him rather than put him as an author. You have to decide on a case by case basis. 
and the final decision of course remains on who is more important, who is the boss. Right. So that uh, criteria for authorship which was mentioned, yeah. I just want to know from where the criteria, this, this particular criteria was taken from. You see at the end of these articles, mm -hmm. there is a small paragraph which says what is the contribution of so and so to the thing and they give a list of names and their contribution. Yes, if yes. you read that then you will know all these are there. Okay. Is it, no, normally it's from and one it's particular also, journal. Also, or also it is. If you want, I can give you the reference. Authorship has been widely discussed mm -hmm. and it is going to be widely discussed Again, here. Uh, and uh, we'll go into the de details a little later. See, statisticians, we seek their help in planning, designing of almost all the experiments, yeah. uh, including the clinical research, clinical trials. They, they, they are kind of ubiquitous. Beg, beg to disagree with uh, you. No, no, no. Most uh, of I, the time, I, poor fellows are consulted after you have collected loads of data and you go and uh, give no, no, them, no, at the planning stage itself it. we do consult. I yeah. think to that extent we uh, should do what have. you said, but we don't do that. That's the problem. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. Uh, yeah. there is also the school of thought that therefore statisticians should find a place inevitably in the list of authors. I was not too comfortable with that personally. I mean, uh, they are doing just their job. No, you don't get on with your uh, No, 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 no. I, I have all the uh, affection for my statistician. Okay, but then. certainly, I thought, well, he's just doing his job just a, like a lab technician or anybody. Planning and designing, fine, fair enough. Uh, but then he turned around and said, now look, uh, we are not uh, thought of very highly, all because our name appears in each of the medical articles. We are assessed by uh, the statistical methodology articles that we publish. Correct. Something like that. That is true. But nowadays many journals have a separate statistical editor also. That shows their importance. Because everybody doesn't have in-depth knowledge, you know. It requires a particular person who is used to doing that. Yes. So while choosing the journal to publish, does it make a difference to choose a free access journal? open access journal or an online only no, journal? Something it is like. a matter of your choice. So usually the they say impact factor for online journals are no. a bit lower. See, you have to online only depends journals. on several things, you know. Sometimes you can get it quickly into print if you don't go for journals which are hard copy. Go for online journals. If you want a lot of color photographs put, online journals may accept, but the uh, hard copy journals will ask a tremendous amount of money which uh, very few people can afford. So you have to be decide based on your work. Thank you, thank you very much.